The ABIM Foundation paired frontline physicians and leading experts to discuss building trust in healthcare. Stephen Swenson and Don Berwick, both physicians and senior fellows, focused on efforts to build trust by better integration of systems. Don, I'm Steve Swenson. We're longtime friends and colleagues. It's good to spend some time with you here. Indeed, I'm Don Berwick, uh, President Emeritus and Senior Fellow at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Great to see you. When I think of trust, I think of you and IHI. And, and so I, I'd love to hear your thoughts about um, the last three decades at IHI. I mean, it started with this cool vision and about that much capital and um, in one city, and 30 years later, you're a global behemoth if you measure power by influence and change and impact. And, and that probably had a little bit of charisma or maybe a lot of charisma behind it and a beautiful vision, but trust had to play a role with your staff and the partnerships with patients and colleagues and medical centers in every culture on the planet. Well, thanks for the question <clears throat> and for the kind comments. I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm really, I feel lucky to have been associated with IHI and it has grown, but it's always felt to me to be kind of part of a very big community of effort that you're in, Steve, and uh, it's never felt to me like one thing that's grown, but rather a collective effort that's mm -hmm. just, um, it's, it's thrived. Um, to the extent that, that there's something in IHI's genetic code around uh, that makes it makes it successful. <clears throat> I've always felt it's friendship. The the uh, the yeah. the origins of IHI, which go back to the mid 1980s, was actually in a group of about seven or eight friends. We we um, independently had discovered the work of the great scholars of improvement, Deming and Duran and others. We were independently interested in healthcare quality, and we found each other. There was a center point that was Paul Batalden, mm -hmm. uh, who was co-founder of IHI. And Paul convened us, uh, some of us strangers to each other, as a learning circle. And for a period of uh, a few years, uh, we, we studied together, we learned together, we, we whined together <laughs> yeah. uh, when we ran into obstacles. Each of us was in place in an organization, but a little bit lonely there. Yeah. But we all believed it was possible to improve health care and, and, and if we learned the right methods. That, it, the, the glue was affection. And um, I think... I think it, it's the, it was the source of trust yep. also. So we weren't competing with each other, we we're helping each other. And that, that ethos, it, it's really stayed through e even to today. Yeah, it's beautiful. And you probably, can you have friendship without trust? <laughs> Very hard to do. <laughs> uh, no, I guess you can't. Yeah. Once trust is betrayed, uh, relationships sever. But that, 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 that idea of relationship, which you've written so eloquently about, I think, um, <clears throat> I think it's core. If we treat what we're doing as transactional, it doesn't work. Yeah. It just doesn't work. It's not sustainable, really. It looks sustainable. It looks clever. It looks mm -hmm. macho, but it's not right. And, uh, yeah, just knowing we're, we're going to help each other and can count on each other, that was, that was really key. It's still there now. And now it's a, I think it's a global community. Yeah. Yeah. What a great story. So at, at its core is quality improvement about trust, where the leaders and organizations or systems or clinics or groups say, you're doing the real work, yeah. and we, instead of giving you the answer, we trust you to figure it out. He, yeah, yeah, of course, Avadis Donabedian famously in one of his last interviews said, quality is about love, with, with which I, I firmly believe so. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, there's a technical side to this that actually roots it for me intellectually, because um, improvement of the type we're invested in is about, it's about systems, about yeah. interdependencies, complex endeavors where what you do affects me and what I do affects you, and we understand that, and we're mm -hmm. going to work together to create a better, a better result for the people we're trying to help. The, the core asset is, uh, is um, cooperation. Yeah. Tom Nolan, who you know, sadly died this year, yeah. my most important mentor, uh, Tom was interested in change concepts, things that actually make a difference. He said the premier change concept, the real, the, when you, when it, at bottom, the one that matters the most is cooperation. 
So, which means we help each other because yeah. we want to get something done for someone else. Yeah. And how it's not going to happen without trust. Otherwise, I'm, I'll be afraid you're going to take something from me in, instead of share something with me. It's fascinating. We're talking about love, and Demi talked about joy in work and cooperation and trust as attributes of some of the most successful businesses. Yeah, and it, it, these are lovely, but soft psychological, sociological terms. Is not. Yeah. Um, it's it's a it's a contest. Do you think it's naive? Do you think that you're you're being uh, you're going to be taken because the world's mean and you know there's a lot of bad stuff out there and the world can be mean and there is a lot of bad stuff out there. So it's you know it's understandable for people to listen to this conversation and say, boy, what what are you guys been smoking? Yeah. But I'll tell you, I've been there, done that, and without that form of bonding, I don't know how you get complicated things done in a sustainable way. It's not through accountability. It's not through incentive. Yeah. It's not through uh, yelling loud enough. Yeah. Uh, it's not through trickery. So show me something better. Yeah. And I think your earlier concept about IHI is that manifestly it works. I must say, Steve, you've added something big to this because you've clarified for me, perhaps more than any other scholar right now, the relationship between which the relationships between what we just are talking about and meaning because I think that why, why should I trust you? What's the reason? And the answer is because we both want to get done with our lives, something that matters to us. Yeah. And if you don't connect to that, you're going to lose heart pretty fast. Yeah, and leaders play a central role in having that happen. It, it, whether you're the founder, president, CEO of IHI, or whether you're a nurse manager, the relationships you have with the people on your team are fundamental and the behaviors that you have as a leader make a difference in the well-being of your staff and that then translates into better care for patients. You know, Maureen taught us that you cannot give what you do not have and if you're distressed in some way um, then patients suffer from experience and outcome and higher costs and and less safe environments. Yeah, you know, I I will ask you a question because the, I think one version of leadership is that you get other people to do things, that you, you know, you, you're smart enough and good enough at using the levers that you can, you can kind of make people do stuff that, so that you align efforts and things like that. But, you know, I don't, I, I'm not so sure. I think that leadership is much more about releasing people to do what they want to do. I, again, that sounds a little naive, but I think, well, Demi used to say, all people want is to be proud and joyous in their work, as you said. And the, the smart leader makes it possible for that. It doesn't command it. Yeah, it's, it, it's a social process to engage colleagues and teams of colleagues to meet challenges together. And, and the, the leader behaviors that are fundamental for this are basically our participatory management, where it's not the sage coming in with the answers, it's, it's he or she humbly listening and inquiring and engaging the team so that everyone collectively can figure it out together. And then that engages them and you see higher levels of fulfillment and meaning and purpose because now you're a, you're a respected and trusted part of the team and um, and then you don't care about your job description anymore because you come to work because you yeah. um, can't wait to work with people to get something done. Yeah, I, I once called a friend of mine who had been promoted to a much more senior job and said, congratulations on being the boss. And he said, you're never the boss. You're never the boss. And I think that's, that's take home. Yeah, and, and if you think you're the boss, then you failed you're because it, it, then, then you're end up being more impressed with the number on the back, the name on the back of your jersey instead of the name on the front of your jersey. And, and you're, you may have the title, you may have the salary, but you won't have the results. So well, one of the things I admire so much about your work at Mayo was you were able to take rather airy ideas about leadership and convert it into a leadership index and really discover some strong relationships quite formally. What, what, um, what spurred you to do that? It's a decade ago now that we started working on this. I was, uh, th that year I was appointed to head up uh, organization and leadership development. And we look, we've been surveying all 60 some thousand of our staff every year since 1981. 
And that year, when I started in that role, we saw that there was a huge variation among physicians in their levels of satisfaction, fulfillment, and professional burnout. And so we said, well, why is there such a variation? And, and you could measure those things. We could measure those things. So we measured those down to the unit level. We also measured leader behaviors, but we never did anything with them. And then um, we talked about this among all the chairs one morning. We, every Wednesday, all the chairs would meet with our CEO, John knows we at the time. And Chet Rehal, the head of cardiologist, said, well, let's look for the positive deviance. So, so what were the departments and work groups that had the highest levels of fulfillment and satisfaction, the lowest levels of burnout? And then we ended up linking that to the behaviors. And it turns out we did a deep dive of 130 different um, units and found that 47% of the variation was due to the leader behaviors. How much variation was there? There, it was staggering. We had a two-fold difference of professional burnout between the highest and lowest uh, areas. And then, so on the 60-point scale, the, uh, the, the staff would answer questions about their leader. And uh, for every one point up, single point up, uh, there was a 9% higher level of professional fulfillment and satisfaction. And for every single point upwards, there was 3.3% lower rates of burnout. So we knew we were, and it was statistically significant, and so we started managing that. So what, what were the elements of the index? Index are, Don, the behaviors are common sense. Really? They're not rocket science. <laughs> they're, just not, they're just not common practice. Appreciation. Thank you for what you did with, for the team today, for this family. It made a difference. It wasn't in your job description, but thank you. Um, I'm inter interested in your ideas. I communicate transparently. What do you want to be doing five years from now? And how can we help your dream come true? And no, we should invite her. Everybody on the team is, should be welcome and, and comfortable and respected. So basically, inclusion and appreciation and transparency those simple behaviors, if the staff thought their chair uh, lived those authentically, they thrived. Did, did you ever worry that you were uh, being too soft, that this stuff is too nice, and that there's an edge to leadership where you have to really you know, be strong and commanding, or is, it, is this really the heart of it? Well, when we, we got criticized by a board member when we went with our results uh, and our, our plan saying, this is soft science. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, it's not soft science. It's rigorous science uh, with controlled studies and p-values, but it's about social science, it's about psychology, it's about uh, sociology and people and, uh, and uh, behaviors but it matters, and look what we've shown. When, when we work on those leader behaviors, uh, burnout rates plummeted over a three-year period, while the national rate went up nine points. Yeah, I remember reading your first quantitative paper on this, and the relationship between the variables you talked about and the burnout levels was stunning. I mean, it was really, really a strong correlation. So rigor science of randomized controlled trials with you know, commensality and meals, it's a soft science, but that but we're people. We're, we have that's the, the nature of it. We're not. <laughs> so what's the, explain this commensality concept, which I first learned from you. It is a it's a great word, and it it means a precious thing for human beings. It's sharing a meal with someone, and um, and it makes a difference in our well being and our ability to take care of patients in, in a in a better way. In the randomized controlled trials, you, you know. One of them we showed or the cortisol levels went down. And Which is a measure of stress. A measure of stress. And we saw that, emotion, that social isolation went down and emotional exhaustion went down and cynicism about the organization went down. All by having professionals and colleagues have a view with someone and a conversation. And, and that, is that soft science? Well, great, bring it on. <laughs> because we know that that makes a difference for patients. And that's so... Um, so um, you said earlier that the, <clears throat> the science is clear, the results are strong, it makes sense, and yet 
it's not, these behaviors are not as widespread as you wish they were. Why not? What, what's in the way? It seems so obvious. Anyway. Yeah, they aren't. And um, I think it's starting to spread. There are people that are measuring it. So many of our healthcare organizations on the planet have a razor thin margin, and th there is an indubitable, rock solid return on investment for patient centered quality improvement and for working on engagement and professional burnout and joy of work. But it doesn't show up on the balance sheet tomorrow or next week or next month. It shows up next quarter and next year. You have to have a long, a long sight. You do. And, and so that's where, uh, the, the, that's part of the problem. You think it's harder to be nice? <laughs> you know, I, th I think it's, everybody has more fun. And, and, and there's more joy uh, in work and collegiality um, if you do that, but it's not the last generation of what bosses did. You, you're not, you're not, the reason we pay you is it, you're not supposed to have fun at work. <laughs> yeah, I remember going to a group suggesting that joy and work become a, uh, a goal, and that group laughed me out of the room. You got to be kidding, and I, you know, made me sad. You know, you were asking earlier about IHI's uh, yeah. successes. Um, you know, one of the most satisfying uh, eras was the 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 campaigns we ran, the Hundred Thousand Lives campaign. You remember that was, I think, two thousand four to two thousand six or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was an amazing experience. We had our board and the staff had looked at our results. We were a little impatient with spread. And so we, and we had some changes that we thought would make a difference in, in survival in the American hospitals. And so we, uh, we just called it out. We said, how about, hey, would you like to join? Would you like to save you know, tens of thousands of lives through adopting some changes? And that one of the lessons I learned through that period that always comes back to me when I read your work is we had no power. There was nothing that that little organization could have done to order anybody to do anything. Mm -hmm. We couldn't pay them. We couldn't create contingencies. Uh, we couldn't reward them or punish them. All we could do was invite them. And that idea of invitation to do something you, that your heart wants you to do, well, it was so powerful, Steve. We had 3,100 hospitals. We had every meeting I remember going to all over the country. It was like, it was like a, I don't know, a festival of commitment to something really important. And you saved countless lives. And as important or more important, you engaged thousands and thousands and thousands of healthcare um, yeah. professionals in, in a long-term passionate game. I, I remember going home from that meeting with Dave Herman, I was just new in the quality leadership, to Mayo said, we're doing this and we're starting tomorrow and we can't wait to get going. And, and at Mayo, that, you, you always make decisions in committees and groups and, and, and and we said, we're not waiting. We, this is so important. We have to do this right now. And we did, and no one objected. And because it was, uh, because you inspired us, and we trusted you, and it made a difference. Yeah. I mean, of course, it's they who saved the lives. Watching these hundreds and hundreds of people around the country dig in and try to do this, it was, it was amazing. We released something, and I wish we could hold on to that and, and build on that. Well, the power of the spirit and passion um, unleashes so much good, and I think that's that doesn't happen unless people trust leaders, and and that's a wonderful case study for how that can work. I know we're almost out of time, but I, I got to ask you one question. On top of that, Have, is your experience with the uh, with the work you've done at Mayo and on burnout and the leadership index is this globally useful? That is, have you gone to other countries and found the same? dynamics at work, or is this pretty much an American model right now? I think the, the two core improvement efforts, in, which one is a quality improvement you know, core that the IHI is in white paper, the two core strategies for addressing professional burnout are universal, as long as you have human beings working. And it's, it's basically identifying frustrations as a team and then fixing the processes or helping leaders uh, 
be more humane and sensitive and participative. And I think that no matter what the language or culture, uh, it's, uh, that's universal like the language of quality improvement. And it probably goes way beyond healthcare for sure. It does. So uh, does your use of and teaching about the leadership index itself build trust? And if so, how does it do that? You know, I think it does. So imagine if you had a leader who authentically appreciated you, was genuinely interested in your ideas, opened the books for you to see all of the information, all the data, all the blemishes and warts, had a special interest in your career and worked with you to become better and included everybody regardless of genome or phenome or creed, um, how could you not trust someone like that? The other thing is, uh, it, it strikes me, maybe I'm wrong, that the leader who believes your science has to trust the workforce. You're going to be uh, seeding quite a bit of control or the illusion of control and you, you better trust them or that's not going to go well. Right. So if, if you're looking at really interested in their ideas, communicating transparently and doing this together, that is a surrogate for I trust you. I, one of my early teachers uh, in the field of improvement was a guy named John Dowd who was a protege of Dr. Demings and I, he, was, he taught me so much and I remember one of the things Dowd told me once was, if, if you're a leader and you don't trust your workforce, don't even start. He, he reviewed it as a precondition yeah. for Profound. improvement. Yeah. Don, it's great to visit. Great to visit. Thanks. Thank visit buildingtrust.org to learn more.